really pleased today to have a guest who's extraordinary in her contributions to statistics and data science education and has provided so many resources for other people to use. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen to show you something about, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Sorry, too, it has fictitious screens there. I'm not gonna try to share my screen because something is going on with my operating system. What I would do if I was able to share my screen, I'll figure it out, is direct you to Wikipedia. There aren't very many people that I've had the pleasure of working with who have Wikipedia pages, but Mina is one of them. I'm really gonna to try to do this again. And that the Wikipedia uh, page describes what she's doing now, senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and she's also been uh, a professor of the practice at Duke. And uh, she's a professional educator at our studio where she's much esteemed and very popular at the our studio conferences that, that come up. Uh, we're gonna to talk to her today a little bit about her, but I, I think mostly about one of the three textbooks that she's written in statistics, which is available for free. Uh, and also to another resource that she's put up, a kind of comprehensive resource uh, source for uh, teaching data science, for people who want to get started teaching data science. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Mina uh, so people can see who you are. Hello. Mina, could you tell us how, how you got started teaching stats or data science? How did you start? Yeah, so I guess I started teaching statistics uh, en route to my PhD. So when I was a graduate student, we kind of had to do some teaching and that's when I started. But I think the difference between um, perhaps some of us who were genuinely interested in teaching versus others who were teaching because we kind of had to is that I always really enjoyed making um, Kind of educational materials it gave me an additional joy I, I i imagine if we were to go back and ask uh my phd advisor he would probably say i spent more than necessary time on teaching um and less than necessary time on other things i needed to be doing but i really enjoyed it and i think one of the things i enjoyed about it is not just like developing materials for students but also to see their kind of um, as they learn and as I learn about how they learn, trying to modify that year after year. So sometime during my PhD, I decided I think this is the sort of thing I'd like to spend more of my time doing as opposed to doing it as a supplement to um, what I do in academia. And then my first uh, position after my PhD at UCLA uh, was at Duke, uh, where I was, which I'm still affiliated with, but that was the professor of the practice position. And um, I think the two things um, worked out nicely. So I did my PhD at UCLA where Rob Gold is a, a professor mm -hmm. there, and he's a great influence for if you're interested in statistics education. and both like a great influence and also uh, he's one of these people who will give graduate students some like room to kind of try out their own thing, which is not always possible at every institution. So I yeah. thought that was really nice. Um, he's also the latest winner of the USCOTS Lifetime Achievement Award, which yes, I think is very appropriate. And I, yeah, I'm, expecting, I I'm expecting maybe it's early in your lifetime to get such a thing, but I'm expecting it soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, I think that was like a really nice influence and I still work with Rob um, kind of, uh, we still have a bunch of projects together, the data fest being one of the biggest ones. And then at uh, Duke, I think one of the um, good things that happened is again, I was teaching my own introductory statistics course, but I was given you know lots of liberty to try to try some new things out. And I think that's what really got me excited about what I'm doing and allowed me the space to develop the materials that you've mentioned earlier. You you also work uh, a part of your time with our studio. Mm -hmm. And is there any synergy between your education 
and data science education work and what you do at our studio? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of synergy. And I think that it's, uh, you know, I was always an, I think from the very beginning, like a user of our studio. Actually, I think our studio came about like as a piece of software um, around, while I was still in graduate school. So that's not how I started learning R, but by the time I finished graduate school, I think I was using our studio, but I've always taught statistics R with our studio uh, from the get go. So I think I've been like an avid user and also an advocate for teaching it in, uh, or using it in teaching scenarios as well. And so the work I do there as part of the education team definitely has lots of synergy with uh, what I do as part of kind of teaching at the university, um, both in terms of material development, so like educational material development. But I think one of the things that I get to do more on my R Studio time, I would say, is also working on um, developing, um, you know, R packages that can be used as part of um, educational materials, whether that's like data sets or things more than that. So I, lately I've been work, working a lot more in interactive tutorials, for example. Um, and also um, another thing that's I think really synergistic is uh, being able to work with the teams like the Tidyverse team who develops a lot of the packages that I used to teach with and being able to take back um, feedback um, not just like verbal feedback from students, but my observations in terms of what are the stumbling points for students, where does the syntax seem to not make sense, and similarly for the RCDO ID as well, like stumbling points for where and how an error is presented and how that can really stumble new learners. Um, so I think being able to have that back and forth conversation, I believe has been useful for the teams and has been really enjoyable for me. Yeah, I've been impressed, you know, two of the people on the Tidyverse team, Hadley Wickham and Winston Chang, they're excellent teachers. I've been yeah. amazed to see how, what an effective job they do, and so a little bit humble to see what an effective job they do just teaching. I'll ask you one little, this bit of a digression. So our studio's just releasing a new, a version four of its mm -hmm. program. And this includes some things like a visual editor. I wonder if you think those are things that instructors might want to look at, or those are other th new features of the system would be things that our instructors would like to know about. I, I think so, absolutely. So that's uh, version 1.4, which is available, I think it's a preview right now. So I've been using the visual editor for a while uh, now just to be testing it out. And I really enjoy the experience. And I think what that is, is uh, the experience now feels a lot more like maybe you're writing in Google Docs, but you happen to have your code in there. Um, so it, I think one of the things that I'm very excited about in terms of teaching with the visual editor is that we can really shave away those points about this is how you do bolding in a markdown. This is how you do section headers in markdown. Not that these are necessarily hard things, but you know we have always talked about how is teaching R while teaching more like and then at the same time teaching markdown maybe overburdening students and my belief about that has been that potentially yes but I think the benefits outweigh the cost but wouldn't it be nicer if we didn't have to say the benefits outweigh the cost that the cost for that was even lower in the sense that they are writing um, in something that feels very natural to them but their documents are reproducible and their code is right there as well. So I think for that reason, I'm quite excited about it. Right. And, you know, the, this collaborative style of working, which is so important in the workplace and also in the education community, uh, that can be a challenge. And using the yeah. old fashioned tools like sending everything by email or giving mm -hmm. a different version name to every document, you know, with the date, uh, they don't work. And so even if there is some learning curve, I think it's tremendously enabling to be able to use those those modern tools. Well, yeah, let, me, I agree. let me ask you. So you've been involved with the Open Intro project. Is it since uh -huh. its beginning, or for how long? Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much since its beginning. Uh, we started this project while we were still in graduate school. So uh, the, the you and David Diaz is that the we? 
Uh, yeah, so it was uh, actually it was David Diaz and Chris Barr who were the nice. like the original founders. Um, so they were both at UCLA as PhD students. I was in the same year with David and Chris Barr was a year ahead of us or something. So they started working on this idea. And I actually remember David talking about we'll have textbooks and it'll be free. And I was thinking, what is he talking about? I don't understand. Um, but so they, they had started working on this project and I came on pretty early on in the life of the project. Um, and one of my original kind of contributions to the project was to write the exercises for the textbook. So we had the one textbook at the time, Open Intro Statistics, and we were working on this preliminary edition and I started writing the, the end of chapter exercises for it. So that was my original role on the project. And now I'm one of the uh, project fellows. So over the years, I've done more and I'm kind of more leading the statistics content now. And David is doing more of the business side, if you will. Uh, yeah. and, and I think sometimes when I say this, people say, wait, what is business in the context of open source? But there is, of course, a business side of things. So Open Intro is now a nonprofit organization right. uh, in the US. And, um, you know, we print books and we send books out to uh, instructors for free for samples. So that money has to come from somewhere and something needs to feed that. So kind of doing that and also thinking about what other event avenues should we venture out to? How do we maintain the website? How do we maintain our database? Those are the sorts of things that David mostly works on now and I work on the statistics content. Great. Well, at this point, my plan was to put up the homepage for the most recent. Yeah, I can share the screen if you want. Yeah, you it like turns out that I was in a Citrix meeting yesterday and oh. Citrix has disabled my computer until I log yeah. out. So, so yes, here. this is exactly where I would have gone. Yeah. So this is open intro. And if you want, I can give like a very brief overview of what's here. Um, so we have a few books um, available. So you can see that statistics is really where we have lots of content on because this is what we've been developing over the years. So open intro statistics is when people think about open intro as a textbook, oftentimes this is the one they're thinking about uh, since it's been around uh, for a while now and we're on the fourth edition. So Open Intro Statistics is the first book. And um, a few things I'll mention in terms of this resource is that all of our textbooks are available for free as a PDF. Um, and some of the textbooks are available at, on, as both black and white and also in color. So not all the textbooks are available in both, but some of them are available. Um, and so we sell the books on Amazon. And so for full disclosure, when you buy books from here, some of the money goes back into like the affiliate, like money goes back into the open into account, which ends up um, being used for the sample books we send out to educators. So if you request a desk copy, that's where that comes from, the money, not from thin air. dollars is not very much to charge for a book. And people might think, oh, it must be a pamphlet of some sort. But it really is no. a book. It really is a book. It really is a book. And I have to say that um, I think students appreciate that this print option is there uh, because some of them actually do prefer the print and that they appreciate that the it is available as a low cost option, but you can also get the PDF is available for free. And also the, another thing is that um, all of the source code for the book is available as well. So if you're an educator who is interested in the textbook itself, you know, you can simply get to that. So um, this will take you to LeanPub where you can choose to donate or you can scroll all the way down and then you can get it for free. Either way is fine, basically. Um, but you can also get to, if you're interested in how was this book written? What is the R code that generated the figures and whatnot? All of that information is openly available as well. And we maintain that on our GitHub repository. So I'll just mention that as a supplement to uh, what's here. So you can see, for example, the source code for the textbook and other projects that we're working on are all away available here. Um, but I'll mention two other things about uh, the textbooks. Um, so one of them is another, so we have a high school level textbook. So we work with a high school teacher, Leah Dorazio, as a co-author there. So that's like an AP curriculum 
uh, high school textbook and uh, some of the examples are modified to be better suited for high school students interests. Uh, so that it's wonderful to have her on board working on that because she is the person working with high school students on a daily basis. Um, and then another book interest up for life sciences and biomedical sciences is actually our first book that is contributed entirely by um, for, uh, from um, kind of uh, folks who were not originally affiliated with open interest. So this is Dave Harrington and Julie Vu from Harvard who have worked on this as an offshoot from the open intro textbook, but their expertise is in the area of biostatistics. So that's available in the same vein as a low cost print option or freely available. And yeah. So you, I'm sure that you know that stat prep has a particular emphasis on providing resources for two-year college instructors. Mm -hmm. And at two-year colleges, and many four-year colleges too, but two-year colleges, the resource problem is particularly acute. Mm -hmm. And so for someone to adopt a new book that isn't the official book for the 10 sections of statistics that are going on at their, at their institution, having open source is just tremendously liberating. Let's them use it as a supplement to the first right. time they do it. Uh, let's them pick and choose chapters. So, you know, that's, that's a great resource. When you got involved in this, was your concern the economics of textbooks or did something you had to say in about statistics or some combination of the two? You know, I think it's a combination of the two. And originally, the, the main impetus was actually the economics of it. And, and I think that some of the ways I thought about it have changed how I thought about it before, but I was thinking when we first started this, it seems like many introductory text textbooks are very similar to each other, but why do they cost so much then? You know, I felt like if a book has really something absolutely new to bring to the table, maybe that's what you're charging for. But if your book is just like the other one, then why are you charging $200 for it? And there's often these considerations, these uh, remarks like, well, uh, you know, for students for whom that's an issue, oftentimes their um, scholarship covers it or something. And I think these may be true and that's fantastic if that's true, but that's certainly not the case for every single student. Um, right. And so I think, I think it's true at the face value until you're that student who is affected by it and then it's not really. But I will say that um, at this point, I wouldn't say open intro textbooks are just like any other textbook. So just don't pay for others. I think that there is a particular point of view that we've been trying to kind of put forth in these textbooks. So it's now a combination of both what we have to say and at what cost we're saying it. Okay, we're starting to get some questions from attendees mm -hmm. and we're gonna to get to those in, in just, just a minute. Uh, I, I did wanna throw in that I'm really, although the economics may seem like something that's not directly pertinent, it is. And I'm really impressed by the way you've been able to structure it. I, I set up a publishing company, Project Mosaic Books, and we haven't been able to get the cost below about $60 for the books. Although now yeah. many of them are available online for free. So I think that's a great job that you and David are, are doing. And so we're getting more questions, which I, I, Felice and Jennifer, I'm glad to see those. Uh, so, I was there in 2005, it was my first statistics conference when George Cobb uh, gave his famous Ptolemaic curriculum talk, which I think is what started the uh, statistics education community really taking seriously this idea of a randomization based curriculum. And now there are at least two uh, commercially available public what textbooks with high production values, the Lock Five book and uh, Nathan Tintel's uh, okay. group's book. Uh, tell us about you, you, where, how you got into this and what, what is, if you want to focus on the new, new edition, I guess yeah. is forthcoming, is released. Yeah, is... yeah. yeah. So we've had this book, um, Introstat with Randomization and Simulation, for a while. Uh, but I have to say that. Um, I don't think it was the best take on things. It's something that we wanted to like have out there. 
Um, but it was really like, let's take the more traditional textbook that we have and see where we can um, add more simulation to it as opposed to genuinely rethinking it. But we are currently working on, so this is uh, myself and um, uh, myself and uh, Joe Harden are working on a new book called Introduction to Mo Modern Statistics. And so let me go ahead and um, open the I'm trying to see like where is the link, but uh, I'll just directly go to Glad it. So I'm not doing, doing having troubles. Yeah. So um, so this is what the book looks like now, and we have a preliminary edition out uh, in the sense that it's available for like review. And actually, there are a couple uh, colleagues who are using it and providing comments as we go. But I'll say a few words about kind of the how we structured the um, the book. So uh, we start with, you know, talking about data and quickly go into modeling and multivariate modeling as well. And um, I think this is lots of influence a lot by work Danny you've done and Nick Horton has done and all this sort of like, uh, let's not wait to talk about modeling until after we talk about inference and think about it more as an afterthought. So we have brought these descriptive models forward and then we talk about statistical inference. And there's a particular cadence to the statistical inference uh, uh, chapters where we talk about randomization tests, bootstrap intervals, and then the mathematical model. So for each of the chapters, that's always the cadence to that. And so, and in terms of the distribution of the content, you can think about it like two thirds of it is on simulation. And then about a third or slightly less of each of the chapters is also going into the kind of the central limit theorem based methods as well. And then we basically go through the categorical numerical responses and then do the same thing for regression as well. So that's the cadence that we're taking. And for each one of the uh, chapters, at the end, uh, we have links to um, our interactive tutorials. So let me scroll down here and I'll uh, click on one of these. So each of the chapters comes with a set of interactive tutorials that are developed using the LearnR package. Mm -hmm. And uh, so while we don't have the R code exposed in the textbook itself, this is basically where we think uh, students would be learning about um, kind of R. And I can perhaps go well, here. Let me interrupt you. To, to, mm -hmm. So Jen Jennifer Ward, who's one of the attendees, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read her question. But uh, it's the last part that I think is most pertinent to you. Some comments from our community college department are that teaching something like R, R while teaching stats is a fool's errand, which is discouraging. I think some exposure to R is a good skill for a student's resume. Do you have any suggestions for a good point in the term to teach R and how much should one teach? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think that it's a question where there's not a one size fits all answer. I think the the question in my heart is, oh, it should be in every single lesson that you teach. But um, that's not necessarily the reality for every single educators uh, kind of uh, like structure that they're teaching in. And that was one of the reasons why for the book, we decided to keep the code kind of uh, like describing what's happening in the R code outside of the uh, main narrative of the chapter. So should you be using this book as a reference with either not R as a software or some other software, you can still go through the content. But um, I think one of the ways of maybe gently introducing students to the code without necessarily having them, if especially if you don't have the time, I would say, to have them in the computer lab with you writing code in the RCDO ID would be perhaps using something like the Learn R tutorial. So these follow individual chapters and maybe I'll launch one of these. Um, and you'll see that as this is loading, it is not, it's actually, uh, there's a lot of narrative in these. So the idea is that the student can use these to review everything they've learned in the chapter. So there's the narrative, but then also we have these code boxes uh, where they can kind of run the code and move on to the next topic and kind of read about a particular data set and then start writing some code. So do I believe that you would be a 
competent R programmer, if this is your in only exposure to R, my answer would be no. But would you get a sense of working with real data and how R works in general? I think the answer is yes. So I think it's a great, great way of doing it if you're doing it in a small, shorter amount of time than what you think is necessary to have a full-blown R component to the course. I'll just tell you that this this year, my project is uh, redeveloping calculus at, at the Air Force Academy here in Colorado Springs. And part of that is genuinely engaging computing because often calculus is about moving symbols around and that's not really mm -hmm. what people use, do when they're using calculus. Mm -hmm. And we've used these uh, Learn R tutorials, the same platform that I think you're talking about, uh, every class day, and we have not in class given a word about how to use R or how to use, how to structure R commands. But with the learn R, you can scaffold what's going on. And so it can be as simple as, oh, press run code and you've made a graph, which is uh -huh. trivial, but, but gratifying to, oh, could you change this variable to that one? Could you, in our case, could you make this a second derivative instead of a first right. derivative? And then you can gradually move your way way up. So I, I found that to be a really valuable, really valuable uh, resource. I'm also uh, I was also interested to see uh, uh, that you're bringing in multivariable models in this new book early on. Mm -hmm. And you know that's something that the latest gaze recommendations are all over mm -hmm. is multivariate thinking. And I, there may be new editions of the of the Lock Five book coming out or the Tintle book. I don't know, uh, but that's something that I didn't see in their first first editions. Uh, and so I think this is, uh, in some ways, bringing together uh, that new recommendation in case that few instructors know what to do with, but also the the uh, better established randomization based techniques. So, that to me is a really strong point about about your book. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're I'm you know really excited about writing this finally, giving this uh, topic a better treatment, and uh, and it's been great working on this with Joe as well. And we've had like lots of passionate conversations about it over the summer. And our goal is to basically uh, get to the first edition over the year, and the book will be available in this, I think, better browsable format online, but we will have a print version of it as well, just like the other books too. Okay, we have a few more questions and then I have, uh -huh. I have one. Uh, so uh, Kenyatta Weathersby asks, is there any talk about adding Python? So great question. And I think my answer is, um, yes, to the extent of, I think, community contribution. So I'd like to, show you one thing. Uh, so one of the things that we have that go along with our, well, that we have this somewhere here, that go along with our labs is the, uh, with our books is the uh, labs. And we actually have Python labs that go uh, along with them as well. So I think I can show them actually here. Um, if you go to the textbook um, and go to labs, you can kind of choose uh, which uh, kind of uh, platform you want them in. I think I clicked on, but you can see that we had originally written these labs in BASAR and we just haven't removed them. We have the tidyverse versions. Uh, there's a platform called Arguro. So somebody else contributed that. That's like a, another uh, ID type thing for R, but we also have Python, SAS and Stata. And the thing is, these are the tidyverse and the base ones are ones like we've worked on, I've worked on myself. But the other ones are community contributions. So, um, so there is more growing Python resources for open intro things. We don't have that same interactive learning platform sort of thing. Um, the learn those, art uh, The learn art, yeah. So, because I actually don't know, there may be very well be a similar um, approach there, but I'm not sure. Uh, but we do have labs at least in Python. So a lot of our stat prep participants uh, have found our web-based apps. So these are Shiny apps. Shiny, I mm -hmm. think, is a product of our studio. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So these are Shiny apps. And uh, 
they found that very useful because there's no coding involved and students can mm -hmm. quickly move around. And I know that the, the Tintel group and the Lock group uh, uh, have done apps in Shiny, uh, maybe in Shiny, but at Penn State, uh, they also mm -hmm. have a large yeah. library of Shiny, Shiny apps. Uh, is that something that you've also pitched in on or are you leaving that to others? Um, so some of our labs actually have Shiny apps embedded in them. So in some of the uh, labs about um, sampling distributions and confidence intervals, there are some of these concepts that are such nicely highlighted. If you have the notion of let's draw many, many samples and you know uh, construct these confidence intervals, for example, and that requires teaching a particular type of computing that we weren't necessarily teaching in the labs, like writing iteration and whatnot. And that wasn't right. one of the focuses of the lab. So for those, we actually have shiny uh, apps for them. So there's not a big suite of them necessarily, but for some of these key concepts, we have them. And we've talked about potentially embedding some of them in the new textbook as well, but that's probably something we'll think about as we get closer to the first edition, yeah. Okay, so there's all these things and uh, the textbook itself, the labs, the learn our tutorials, these, these apps such as you have them and that the community has contributed. Mm -hmm. So now we've got a question about one more thing. What else can you do for us? Uh, so Felice Shore asks, what about electronic homework, homework platforms? Do open source texts have such things? That's certainly a big draw for the co costs of other programs. And I remember talking to David Diaz about this when he was just starting at, at uh, JSM, when he was just starting uh, Open Intro. Right. Do you have anything to say about uh, electronic homework platforms? I do. So for example, we actually have My Open Map as one of them. Uh, so there is, so there are a few contributors to the project who have made the content available in these platforms. So My Open Map is one of them. Um, I personally have not been involved with like any doing any of the porting over of the content, but uh, we've had requests from instructors. So this is one that's an I believe an open source one, the My Open Math. So that's uh, one place you can find them. But there are a few other. Um, I think we've had requests for others, and because the book is licensed in a way where it's openly licensed and others can actually use the content with attribution. I know that other platforms have adopted these questions as well. So you very well might be able to find them in other platforms too. Some we know of, some we don't necessarily, I think. Uh, but the My Open Math stuff is linked nicely from the, um, uh, the Open Intro website that you can read more about in terms of the integration. I'll just mention, as part of my work here at the Air Force Academy, uh, I put together an, uh, an electronic homework platform uh, using uh, some of the RStudio technology and using a great idea from Colin Rundell, who I think you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and we've got a couple of hundred Air Force cadets using this to hand in all of their homework and get feedback from it interactively. Uh, and so if people are interested in having a really completely open source and a customizable system, I'd be happy to have, I'd love to have people working on this with me, but we have a working system in place. That's great. It'd be primitive. And before we move on to data and science in a box, so do you have any suggestion for an instructor who's never taught randomization in a, a statistics in a randomization based way, how they could get started? Yes, I think that what I would say is, the first thing I would say is, um, I think an instructor should decide whether to them, the randomization based approach in their mind makes more like fits better when you're thinking about like a hypothesis, like a randomization test situation, probably like a two by two table type thing or a bootstrap interval. And I think that educators disagree about which one to start with intervals or tests. And I don't necessarily believe there's necessarily one right way of doing it. I think it's really about whichever one you think you'll be able to articulate better without saying, and then we do things over and over again without giving context. I think that whichever one 
makes more sense to you in terms of, I feel like I can communicate this to my students as to why it actually does uh, make sense to be resampling from the sample we have or reshuffling the cards we have and stick with that in terms of a starting point. Um, and I think that uh, working with um, also in terms of teaching uh, randomization, one of the things I do like is doing things with your hands like cards, things people can draw from. And even if you're teaching online this year, I think this is still possible where people, if they happen to have playing cards at home, they could still shuffle them and you could have a Google form or something where they submit their responses and you could make a histogram of those. I think getting students to do that once with their hands and think about um, you know, what they're doing at every step of the way is so much more intuitive than either expecting them to know what you're talking about just because you're saying the words or writing the code for it. While I'm a true believer that like for the courses that I teach, we ultimately write the code for doing this. I don't think that's the right place to start because it's too many concepts altogether that I think genuinely stopping and thinking and touching the objects you're shuffling makes a huge difference. That would be what I would say. Yeah, I've seen for myself how much better students respond to the randomization approach, unless they're algebraic mavens. Uh, and one thing, uh, uh, many statistics educators, especially if they don't have much experience in statistics, think that the algebra is the real thing and that the randomization is a, you know, an, an approximation, a proxy, is inference light. Uh, and that's certainly not true professionally. Uh, yeah. but over the, over the last year, I wrote a little, a little book that's available online called A Compact Guide to Classical Inference. And there, I, just, I show how all of these formulas and all of the stuff that gets wrapped up in this algebra-based curriculum, how the algebra could be made much, much simpler and much, much more general. So it's not really about the true thing or the, a, a computer approximation. That's, that's no longer a reasonable division. Uh, it's really about what works for students. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm really glad to see you working on, on this. And speaking of what works for students, I know that in the last couple of years, you've been putting a large amount of effort into data science mm -hmm. and figuring out how to put together data science curricula. Uh, and I, I, I can't say this for sure, but the curricula that you presented at meetings seem to be so comprehensive and to have the whole toolkit that one needs to do data science. Uh, and recently you ha have packaged this up into a box, into data mm -hmm. science in a box. Yeah. Uh, what motivated you to do that? What does it look like? Uh, what should people know about it? Yeah, so I'll share. Um the website, so it's datasciencebox.org. So this is another kind of open source resource that I've been working on. And um, you can see the last time I touched it was only a couple of days ago. So, um, so what's here is a full curriculum for teaching data science. And so I'll say a bit about what's here first and then talk about the uh, kind of the motivation behind it. So there are three or actually four component, four parts to this. I've uh, kind of structured it as almost like a book just to make the navigation a little bit easier. But the first part is about um, as an educator, what you should know about what's here. So I talk a little bit about the design principles for uh, kind of this content. Uh, I link to a talk that I've given at the end that I still uh, feel very kind of nicely about. It's called Let Them Eat Cake First. I feel like that really like kind of, um, summarizes my um, thinking about this content, but also other kind of uh, practical things like what exactly do we cover in each of the units? And then there's the course content, which is I assume what a lot of the instructors would be interested in. So I'll open one of the learning units. So you can see that there are um, for each uh, kind of lesson uh, slides, but also the source code. Um, any sort of application exercises students could work on and reading assignments that would go along with them. And so this is uh, available for a full length course. Um, and in addition, we've developed more learner tutorials that go with this content. Um, so those are available here. 
a description of a project you might give to students. Uh, along with in the repository, I have some uh, sample like rubrics and whatnot as well. Um, I'm going to be adding the videos here that I'm making this semester. And then uh, also things like in the past, I used to give take home exams with this. I actually haven't been doing that in the last couple of years, but all of this is here. Um, and the I, and the reason why they're here as a complete package is that um, I often stumble upon really fantastic educational materials like on Twitter or maybe at a conference. And I'm like, this is a really great example. Like what a nice data set. And then by the time I sit down and think, I want to use that for my class. I'm always a little confused as to, oh, I wonder what the students that this person who put together these materials, students learned before this. So you kind of don't have the full continuum. So then I find it quite challenging myself to adopt sometimes those materials, or it takes me a lot longer than I would like to be able to do that, because I really need to get in the mindset of, what are the prerequisites? Where does this fit in a curriculum? So the idea with this was to, um, you know, for some educators, and I know some educators are using it as such, um, to provide genuinely a full length curriculum that they can just take and use as they want. And since we provide the source code, they can modify it or use it as is. Um, but I figured that many educators would also just be using bits and pieces of it, like maybe one homework assignment from there, a project from there, something like that. But they always know exactly where it fits in the curriculum, what came before it and what came after it. Um, and then I also have some other additional kind of discussion around, well, if you're an inst instructor, how might you set up your R infrastructure? If you're going to teach version control, how might you set those things up? Um, and I'll say one last thing about it, um, and then like maybe we can uh, do more of a discussion. Recently, as of kind of a few months ago, we also have like a, um, a Slack community uh, for this as well, so a Slack channel, and um, and it's been really nice, especially this semester of like being isolated at home, talking with instructors who are using this curriculum and kind of asking questions, but also making suggestions along the way. Some people send in pull requests. Some people just say, hey, Mina, this is confusing. Like, what did you mean here? And I think the resources have been getting better with those conversations going on alongside. That's great. I, you know, I've, you don't know this. I've stolen the outline of your data science in a box as the documentation for this Air Force calculus course. So I, I just found what, the way you arrange things really helpful for instructors. And it really is a site intended for instructors. Is, is there a, a textbook or are we not there yet in the, in the um, uh, that, data that, science that, education community? No, I think that's, that's brewing in my head as we're writing the randomization textbook. Actually, and one of, that was one of the big motivations for moving it into the book down platform, because for this one, we would actually be exposing the R code as well. So that's certainly the next project after this. And I feel like now I have enough content to quick, well, nothing happens quickly, more seamlessly go from what we have to a textbook format. But I think it would be great to have it all in one place. Um, so that's gonna be the next open intro project probably. And, and you've used in the past uh, Garrett and Hadley's textbook is that right yeah that's right so the data readings science with for R? this mm -hmm. so r for data science so many of the readings come from r for data science and then it's padded with readings from the introduction to modern statistics and the reason for that is i think right now the open intro book does not do justice to like talking through the r code but r for data science does and r for data science doesn't say a whole lot about statistical thinking or working with data per se. It's like, maybe you know those things, but you wanna know how to do them in R, but if you're entirely new to working with data or statistics in general, that's not the right book either. So I think something that would be really supplementing this curriculum would be somewhere in between the two of them. And obviously can't cover both things and would have to give up on some stuff, but hopefully be a more cohesive reading that would supplement this curriculum. Have you seen the Modern Dive textbook by Andrew Bray? Do you have any anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I think that's a great textbook. Um, it's who Albert Kim and Albert Kim Chester? and Andrew Bray. Right, Chester. I think Chester. Yeah, 
anyway, so yeah, I have seen it. I think that's a good good textbook for kind of bringing R into the um, kind of into the textbook as well. Uh, and uh, it's another book that's freely available that I think is great uh, as such a resource. Uh, so I would certainly recommend for those who are teaching R as a core component of their introductory statistics course, I would say that that's a, I think that's a great one to take a look at. And has some nice resources associated with it as well. There is, I think, um, I, th I think it does certain things in a very modern way and then certain things in terms of statistics in more of a traditional way. But I think it's a great step into like incorporating R into the statistics curriculum at the intro level. Yeah, I've, and I posted uh, the website. Oh, they, they put, mm -hmm. they'll correct and put a space in modern dive, but one word, dot com. Yeah. Well, so, what I want to find out what you think is next, and I, I mean that in in a couple of different ways. One is, what do you think is next in stats or data science as professional fields that educators should be keeping an eye on? But also, what do you think is next in teaching stats and data science and how that, whether those two should be taught independently or taught in a coordinated fashion. Uh, so where do you see things going ideally? And uh, yeah, I, so I think that I'm kind of hoping that there won't be too much of a distinction um, between like at least introductory stats and introductory data science in the near future, but I'm very, I want to acknowledge the fact that it's that's not just going to happen. So I think one of the things that has been very eye-opening about teaching data science, which I would say means I see students at their computer a lot more, like doing things with data as files and they bring them in and they plot them and then they have to make a report and then they have to export it out. And one of the things that I realize is that even though we keep saying that, you know, the new generation has grown up with computers, what how they have used the computer is not necessarily, does not necessarily translate to high skills when you think about doing data science, which means that there is, um, you know, just teaching them the code, uh, saying that we'll just teach some R and then we'll call that data science, I don't think is going to work. I think we need like, general like computing literacy to go come alongside that um and i think that there's then that presents a challenge in terms of teaching data science so i think in an idea what i would like to see next is that we are doing more and more of the computing as opposed to saying um this is hard we can't do it or i think i hope i think that we need to embrace that and we need to come up with better ways of teaching um workflows to students that don't make their data science experience painful so they can continue to focus on the data because lots of what I see nowadays is like you want to teach them how to make a plot but they're struggling loading the data because you know like for example something like using a server setup for our studio helps immensely with that that's like a huge step in the right direction. It's not enough on its own, but it's a huge step in the right direction. So I'm hoping that we'll have some more technological solutions like that, that make that onboarding more seamless for students so we can do more computing in the intercurriculum. And um, it doesn't mean that we're overburdening students on day one of the class. Um, I think the question about whether stats and data science will stay as separate you know, fields to be taught versus B1. I, I, I hope that we can incorporate them together at least at the earlier end of things. Um, Which should come first? I think working with data needs to come first. I really do think so. I, and I think that there is, so here's how I kind of think about this. There are certain things in statistics you cannot learn without knowing certain mathematical topics. Um, there are certain aspects of a statistics degree you're going to need to know a little bit of linear algebra for, or a little bit of calculus three or something for. 
That is not to say everything in intradata science you don't need a prerequisite for, but I think you can do a lot more exciting stuff in a first course that's a data that's structured more like a data science course, as opposed to telling students um, you'll have to wait a few semesters before before we can get to the exciting step stuff because I feel like that's what a more traditional statistics curriculum has felt like, and I think we want to give the exciting stuff alongside any sort of prereqs they have to take to be a, a statistician by the end of their curriculum. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just mention that one of the aspects of this Air Force Calculus project is that we do linear algebra and vectors, and we do a lot of calculus in the first semester and in the first year, which we can mm -hmm. do because of computing. Uh, and that was that design is partly because the Air Force was very interested in having data literate uh, officers, and so that that they put a high priority, a high priority on those on that. And uh, in your own professional professional plans, anything that you're looking forward to doing? You mentioned perhaps a data science textbook. Um. Yeah. So so a couple of things that I'm involved with nowadays. So. The uh, working on this introduction to modern stats book and then venturing on to a data science, like an introduction to data science book under the open intro umbrella are things I'm like in terms of writing, those are my big projects that I'm looking forward to. Um, on the R side, I've uh, recently joined the R forwards group, which is a group for uh, kind of increasing uh, diversity in the R community. And it predates our ladies, which I'm very kind of involved with and really, really enjoy a lot. But as part of that, uh, I'm working with um, a colleague there at Morand and we're working on some perhaps workshops for teaching writing packages and but creating these workshops in a way where others can take the materials and teach others. So that's something that's like a new, I haven't taught uh, writing our packages before, uh, but I have experience developing content others can teach from. So I'm excited kind of about that. And then a couple other projects I'm working on uh, uh, with Hadley on uh, like a frequently asked questions project for ggplot2. That's been actually like a data science project for me because I've harvested data from Stack Overflow to try to see what are <laughs> what are uh, frequently asked questions and kind of writing answers for them. So that's been exciting on that front. So those are the things that I'm um, I'm working on slash looking forward to working on uh, because lots of time nowadays seems to be going to making videos with this uh, very unusual semester. This is a very unusual semester. Well, Mina, yeah. I want to thank you for taking the time. It's it's late there and it's dark there. Yeah, it gets dark very early here. It's almost nine, not too late. Almost nine, not so late. And I think it's great. Your work has been very good. I, I do want to find out about a rumor uh, and find out if it's true. Uh, so the rumor is that you are one of a set of identical triplets because there's no other way that, no way that one person could do all the stuff that you're doing. <laughs> so will, can, can we meet your sisters? No, I'm not going to say in front of thousands of people who the identical triplets are. It's going to remain a mystery. <laughs> All right, well, I guess mysteries can be, can be good. Uh, so I think the last chance for uh, the participants to ask questions, you can do that via the chat, we, we, or we can unmute you if you raise your hand. But uh, let's give a moment for, for those questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Looks like maybe there's one question from Felice, is that right? Uh, Felice Ashore uh, was talking, was endorsing what you'd said about. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. But she also, so she, she asked, and having a pair of students plot their randomization statistic on a class dot plot to see the distribution of where the center is. And then there's a big bang. She finds that <laughs> a good experience for students. Uh, yeah. Could you say in a nutshell how an intro data science course is different than intro stats? Yeah, I can say in an answer. I think uh, the 
touching the data much earlier, I would say, I suppose is in my mind a little bit different than a more traditional introductory stats course, like working with data and also thinking about, uh, you know, where that data comes from, not from like an experimental design or study design perspective, but actually like a data is a file on your computer. Where did that come from? How did it get there? How do we actually ingest it and start working with it? What if it's not clean? What if it's not in the shape that you want? I think that's one of the differences. Um, I think there's a much higher computational um, kind of emphasis in a data science course than an intro stack course. And the reason why I think about these as one or the other is because, you know, as much as we embrace computing, um, the semester length isn't increasing. So you can't just add these things into a semester. Something has to leave in order to be able to do this. So you have to, unfortunately, you know, um, tell some of your children they don't get to come on the boat when you're actually like moving on to changing your curriculum a little bit, which can be heartbreaking. But I think some things from an intro uh, stack curriculum needs to go away. And in my kind of thinking about this, the things that have gone away have been, what are the difference, what, different ways we calculate standard errors? Like not because I think a statistician shouldn't know them, but the idea is maybe it doesn't have to, it can't, it's, if something has to go from the first semester course, what are some things that we can shave away and wait till later in perhaps a more mathematical context and bring in more of the computing? And I think it was Alan Rossman who set the theme for one of the USCOTS meetings that happened in May. I don't know what's going to happen this May, but uh, it was letting go to grow was the, the statement of the theme. And, uh, you know, to echo your point, when you look at graphics, textbook statistical graphics are horrible. And they're really designed around explicating statistical theory rather mm -hmm. than presenting rich data. Yeah. And so that's an area where it seems to me the data scientists and the, the media, I don't know what to call them all, but uh, the people, uh, like 538 group, all those people have used and developed visualization techniques. Hadley Wickham has been very important in doing this with ggplot too. Uh, yeah. So looking at textbook statistical graphics, I think, I mean, box and whisker plots, really, you know, like, uh, but yeah, there, there, there would be a lot to to let go of mm -hmm. in order to grow. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mina, thank you so much for taking the time yeah. with us, and thanks for your yeah. contributions to the education community. Thank you. And thanks to our participants for posting questions and their interest in the subject. Uh, this is going to be uh, the recording of this will be available uh, online. The MAA will tell us. What, uh, where to locate that, that'll be available through the Stat Prep uh, website. Uh, and well, all I can say is thank you and good luck, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Good night.